Hi, welcome to China Unscripted. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. And I'm Shelley Zhang. I don't mean to be cryptic, Shelley, but today we're talking about cryptocurrency. Some are calling it the world's most democratic currency. And of course, it's taking root in one of the world's least democratic countries, China. So how much do you know about cryptocurrency, Shelley? I'm sure not as much as you do. Uh, uh, sure, surely. Uh, so to help us talk about cryptocurrency, we have a special guest joining us. Josh Ganezda started his career with Merrill Lynch before founding a hedge fund research company in 2008. He now runs a business researching cryptocurrency investment funds. He's also producer Matt Ganezda's brother. Welcome, Josh. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Great to have you. So, Josh, I mean, I, I completely understand cryptocurrency, but for Shelley's sake, can you explain what cryptocurrency is? Well, cryptocurrency is a, essentially it's an alternative to the fiat system that's pretty much... Uh, now, I know what fiat <laughs> is, but for <laughs> Shelley's sake... Yes, for me, I only have a degree in economics from UPenn. Didn't you get an English degree? I have both. You get double <laughs> major. You did. Anyone ever tell you we're an overachiever? Well, as Shelly knows, but Chris may not, uh, fiat currency is the bills that you have in your wallet, but it's also all the money we use in our banking system right now. So that includes your credit card, any sort of digital deposit you have at a bank. So Essentially even like anything credit. but cryptocurrency. Yes, and even credit would be part of the fiat system because that money is all created by central banks. So we have the Federal Reserve in the United States. Europe has the European Central Bank. And even countries like China have their own central bank um, that allow them to control the money supply. Okay. So what is cryptocurrency then? So cryptocurrency is an alternative to the fiat system, although it's not necessarily only an alternative. But what it allows you to do is to make peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Um, when I, If I were to give you money, if I were to make a purchase at a store right now using my credit card, I'm essentially sending money via the bank, and then that bank is going to deposit with your bank. And so we have an intermediary. And Bitcoin essentially allows us to um, get around that by having um, the transactions go directly peer to peer, almost like I was giving you cash. Now, you said Bitcoin right there. Is Bit Bitcoin is not the only cryptocurrency. No, it's not. It's actually it's the dominant cryptocurrency, and it's the most well known, but it's only one of actually uh, about a thousand cryptocurrencies that exist. A thousand? There's, there are a lot. There's been a huge push and um, there's been new ones being released almost every day to kind of take advantage of this excitement and the climate in cryptocurrencies. But Bitcoin and a few others um, are really the dominant ones and make up a huge percentage of the actual value in cryptocurrencies. Well, so that doesn't make sense to me. How can there be like thousands of these cryptocurrencies and, and they have any value? Well, that's a great question. I think a lot of people argue that most of them or even all of them shouldn't have any value. And there's a lot of people that suggest that no cryptocurrencies should have value. There's others that think that maybe one or two will survive, and that could be Bitcoin, it could be Ethereum, or it could be one that doesn't even exist yet. Hmm. Right now, what determines the value of cryptocurrencies? Well, the value, like pretty much anything in a free market, is determined by what people are willing to pay for it. And even in countries like China that haven't historically been known for having a pure free market, it still is traded globally. So the price of Bitcoin is set by what someone's willing to pay for it. Well, so then isn't it still tied to fiat currency? In a sense, yes. The only way to buy your first cryptocurrency is to exchange cash, some sort of fiat currency, onto an exchange and buy your first cryptocurrency. Once you have that, you could transact and exchange it for other cryptocurrencies. But initially, you do have to start with fiat currency. Why would anyone, what are the advantages of cryptocurrency over any other form of money? Um, well, I think anonymity is one. That's clearly one that some people value. But there's other advantages too, which are, for example, for large transaction sizes, um, a typical Bitcoin transaction, although the actual cost of doing that transaction varies, and it varies based on how many other transactions there are and how many people are mining, it's typically under a dollar, 50 cents to a dollar. So you could, for example, transfer a million dollars worth of Bitcoin for a dollar, um, you know, which is just fractions of fractions of a percent. Mm -hmm. Whereas, um, you know, a large purchase with a credit card might not do a million dollars, but even a, you know, even a $10,000 purchase on a credit card paying 3%, um, you know, that adds up very quickly. Um, 
So it's potentially cheaper for large transactions. Currently, it's not necessarily cheaper in terms of fees for day-to-day -day purchases. If you were to purchase a, you know, a bottle of milk, you know, a credit card fee might end up being 50 cents to the merchant, for example. Um, whereas, you know, it could be, you know, a dollar for Bitcoin. So it might not be viable for very small purchases at this point. But um, costs are another element where cryptocurrency could be cheaper than the current system. So how do credit card companies feel about this? Partly they are considering whether to back coins like Ripple that would allow them to maintain some control um, and potentially still have fees. At this point, they're actually doing well because a lot of people on exchanges in the U.S., Coinbase is the largest um, exchange and most commonly used. A lot of people have been buying cryptocurrency using their credit card. And so Coinbase is as the merchant essentially is charged a fee, the same fee that the credit card companies have been getting on everything else. So at this point, they're actually not necessarily losing a lot of money. And cryptocurrency, as valuable as it is, is not being used for a lot of transactions. Yeah, I was going to say, I still can't go to my corner store and use Bitcoin. Right. And no, there's very like few things you can buy with it. 0.005 of Bitcoin for something. <laughs> that would probably still be very expensive. That's though. true. Yeah. So is it really, uh, as some people describe it, the world's most democratic currency? It is in the sense that it doesn't rely on any one person or any one institution. Um, it essentially relies on millions of what they call nodes, which are individual computers or processors that are helping to maintain the ledger. And the ledger is just essentially a, a record of all the transactions. If I send you one Bitcoin from my, what they call a digital wallet, you'll receive one Bitcoin in your wallet and one will be deducted from mine. And the whole group, which is millions of different nodes, all agree essentially that that transaction took place and one is added to your account and one is subtracted from mine. And so in that sense, there is no, there is no Federal Reserve governor um, there is nobody overseeing it all. Once the code was put in place, um, it, it really is quite democratic in that sense. So all cryptocurrencies are run the same way? No. That's a great question. They're not all run the same way. There's, um, for example, one of the larger cryptocurrencies is Ripple, which is, um, has the support of major financial institutions in the United States. And they have a lot of control over how it's used whether there's some talk right now about whether Ripple should be truly anonymous or whether that could actually run into some sort of issues with regulators. So uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are much more in that sort of democratic sphere that we talk about. And then there's other ones like Ripple that really aren't. Do you think that Bitcoin and Ethereum, the democratic way that they're doing it, it will last? Uh, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I think in general, the idea of the blockchain that underlies it which allows these transactions to take place. In other words, thousands of people distributed across the globe, all coming to a consensus on what took place, on what the state of that record is. Uh, I think that will succeed. But it's really hard to know whether a currency like um, Bitcoin could succeed. It takes a huge amount of energy um, to process all these transactions. And there's a lot of resistance from very powerful people and central bankers um, not only in the U.S. and Europe, but I think also as we're seeing now in countries like India and China as well. Why do you suppose that is? Well, I think there's always people that prefer the status quo. Mm -hmm. And particularly the powerful, I think, throughout history have had concerns about any sort of major upheaval in the status quo because the status quo works quite well for them. I think there's also a legitimate concern that some cryptocurrencies could be used for terrorism or for crime. Any sort of anonymous payment at this point I think causes concerns for certain people in the intelligence community. And I think just generally um, countries enjoy, you know, there's never been a, a push for a world currency. And I think countries enjoy having the control over their money supply. Since we're going to talk more about China, we know that one of the things that China has done is control the money supply of its currency, which has allowed it to be very competitive in the world market when it um, exports goods. So vis-a-vis -vis Japan and Korea and so forth. And so it's concerning for countries to not have full control over the value of their currency. China in particular is undervaluing or overvaluing the UN depending on what they want to achieve with the right. economy. Uh, but they would not have that kind of control over cryptocurrency. They would not. But China is probably 
one of the closest countries in the world right now to becoming a cashless society. So don't you think there is an appeal to something like Bitcoin or uh, cryptocurrency? I would think a country like China where people are becoming accustomed to a purely cashless society. Uh, I think individuals are more likely to want to adopt uh, a cryptocurrency because it doesn't seem as foreign to them as it might to countries that are still used to trading with, you know, physical in cash or other, you know, types of physical um, transactions. Or goats. I yeah, or trade, could, I could, it could be goats. It could be goats. anything. So I think an important difference in the semi-cashless society China has now and using cryptocurrency is that currently, you know, a lot, so for example, a lot of uh, transactions in China now happen over the WeChat, WeChat app, which is heavily monitored by the Chinese government. So basically, currently the Communist Party has a way to track pretty much every single transaction anyone is making. Right. But if there's a push to use cryptocurrency, then the exact opposite will happen. They have no way to monitor people's transactions. I think that's generally true. I don't think that Bitcoin is truly anonymous, although it's certainly a lot closer to being anonymous than any sort of payment app that's currently in existence, whether it's you know WeChat or in the United States and a lot of other countries we use PayPal or credit cards, which are all linked to you. When you set up those accounts, you give them your name, your address. And so everything about you is on record somewhere. And no matter how you go about that transaction, whether it's from a public Wi-Fi or not, it's still connected back to a record that has your personally identifiable information. With cryptocurrency, that's not necessarily the case. Um, it could be the case if you use a service like Coinbase or certain exchanges where you might give them your personal information or you might give them money via your traditional bank account. There could be a trace there. But it certainly has the potential to be much more anonymous than traditional digital transactions. Right now in China, the government has essentially banned Bitcoin trading. Do you think they're going to be able to ban cryptocurrencies? It's a tough question. Um, China obviously has a great deal more control over the internet than a country like the U.S. does. So they've currently banned, they've banned domestic exchanges. They also, I believe, are in talks and considering banning outside uh, foreign exchanges, which could be in Singapore and Hong Kong, London, what have you. And they might be able to do that because of their, you know, the firewall they maintain. At least they might be able to make it very, very difficult for the average person to transact in cryptocurrencies. It seems like one of their biggest concerns with cryptocurrencies, uh, cryptocurrency trading is the the potential to use it for, for example, money laundering or getting their people getting their money out of China, which is a common problem in China. Right. I think that's a that's a legitimate concern, not just for China, but for other countries. And that's because on something the size of a, um, a USB drive, you could potentially store billions of dollars. Um, so the the money Man, density is very that. high. And, and that's true. And if you lost it, um, you know, you can there are ways around that, of course, by making backups and so forth. And you're, in order to access your wallet, you have a private passphrase. So there's two elements to securing your money. But um, it's certainly much easier than taking briefcases full of you know, dollars or other currency. I'm now imagining like a remake of Ocean's Eleven where their whole heist is to get a USB drive <laughs> <laughs> from somebody. That oh, could we very well a, be the case. We have, a, we have a hit movie on our hands next. There have been robberies, physical robberies of people for cryptocurrency where they've actually been physically assaulted and had, uh, whether it was a zip drive, a USB drive, or some other form of, you know, and sometimes in the old days, people used to actually write their passphrase and wallet on a piece of paper um, and store it physically that way. So, and there have actually been robberies. Hope that happened when Bitcoin was at its peak and not in the valley. <laughs> I, I like how you said in the old days, people used to write it down. Like that was so long ago. <laughs> Five people... years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Who writes their passwords down nowadays? Not me. Or anyone I know. Well, so it's it's interesting the Chinese Communist Party's relationship with cryptocurrency because obviously for an authoritarian regime, there are risks to the world's most democratic currency. But, for example, uh, Bitcoin mining, most of it happens in China. So there is cryptocurrency really has been rising in China. How is that conflict happening? That's a very good question. It's an interesting dynamic because, as you said, more than half of the world's cryptocurrency mining 
which is the process used to verify the ledger that we talked about, occurs in China. Um, and that's because there is abundant, very cheap electricity, whether it's from coal powered plants or it's from hydroelectric, which you know China is a world leader in. There's essentially subsidized or otherwise very cheap electricity and it takes and a huge amount thing. even though the government will move to ban bitcoin there are cases of the government actually subsidizing these bit these mining local bit- governments Lo- ah yes. there it yeah. is local governments uh supporting these uh, bitcoin miners with state power yeah i think that's a key distinction that it's local governments um whereas the people's bank of china and other people at in the federal side of the government are having greater concerns and are, I think, seeking to curtail these. You know, some of the um, Bitcoin miners in China are able to get electricity for two cents per kilowatt hour. And um, I actually checked my bill before I came in here today and I'm paying over 25 cents. And so that's it's more than, you know, it's one tenth of the price of what someone would typically pay for electricity on the in the retail market. And a huge amount of the cost in mining is electricity. So you can't be competitive um, if you don't have very cheap electricity because those with it are driving down the returns from mining. So just to clarify, the importance of the mining is that's how they're creating the currency, right? Yes. That's how new coins are created. And it's also how all other transactions are verified. So if you are mining Bitcoin, is that now your Bitcoin? It's a it's a luck of the draw, essentially. But when you're mining Bitcoin, every 10 minutes or so, a dozen new Bitcoins are created. And those will go to the miner that solved a sort of mathematical problem. And what's formed are these large pools because it's so erratic. It's And it's very much uh, a function of your computing power and then just raw luck of whether you receive those Bitcoins. So what's happened is that you have these large pools in which you have thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people all mining and sharing the gains. And that way you're more likely to see something that's relatively related to the amount of um, computational work that you did. So what does it mean to mine and create a Bitcoin? Um, again, it's just really the, the process of verifying these transactions. And it's intentionally very um, processor heavy. And that's to that's actually for the security of the system. It, um, it prevents attackers from easily coming in with just a small amount of computational power and either changing the history that's all these miners are preserving the history of all transactions and it's to prevent someone from coming in and doing something like that or a denial of service attack so it it actually while it seems a bit crazy and bitcoin mining uses as much electricity as switzerland and that does seem crazy when you think about it whoa but it's intentionally so so is it sustainable then if it uses so much energy? It's not clear. Um, there's been a lot of attempts to make cryptocurrencies either through a fork off of essentially coming up with a related but separate currency from Bitcoin or from new um, cryptocurrencies to make them less energy intensive, but still preserve the security elements. So one thing that I read that I thought was pretty interesting was that the Chinese government may try to create their own digital currency is cryptocurrency something that's do you think that states will the get world's involved most in? authoritarian <laughs> currency yeah it's it's totally possible i mean already a couple of places have done it um, in venezuela they've created this petro backed um, cryptocurrency because the venezuelan dollar has been in free fall for or peso their currency whatever it is and i they're not doing financially very well. They're not doing well for a lot of reasons. And their currency has borne a lot of that pain. And so they've been trying to create their own cryptocurrency that they would then trade in when they export oil, for example. That hasn't gone very well. There's a lot of hesitancy by partners to accept a cryptocurrency for that. From so, Venezuela. Spe- particularly hmm. from Venezuela. But I think in general, there's a hesitancy, right? So could I create my own you cryptocurrency? Could. My gosh, Shelley. I thought of a great way to raise money for <laughs> in fact Uncensored a lot of people have coin. been creating their own cryptocurrencies and uh, a few of them mysteriously have actually done rather well really? yeah i read about dogecoin which yes. for a coin based on a meme seems to oh, not dog? done too badly yeah really yep i guess this is the future we're in it started as a joke and i mean it's worth tens of millions of dollars now so dogecoin oh. yeah oh my gosh <laughs> i'm so creating my own 
currency. This is this is great. But whether you can get people to value it at anything is anyone who would like to use uh, the Chris Chapel uh, cryptocurrency, leave a comment below. <laughs> uh, prove Shelley wrong. <laughs> oh, okay, I see it. This is going to be the world's most spiteful currency. <laughs> So what would it mean if the Chinese Communist Party creates its own cryptocurrency? What they would probably do is create a cryptocurrency that's still backed by their currency. They don't want, I don't believe, a cryptocurrency that competes with their control over the money supply. So it would probably be exchangeable for currency. And it would be backed by it and it would be priced in such a way that it was, um, that it didn't disrupt the traditional use of their fiat currency. And probably still subject to all the same rules and regulations as the UN. Yeah, and they could certainly, if they were the one developing the cryptocurrency, it would give them a lot more control over it, much in the way digital transactions currently are controlled. Hmm. Could cryptocurrency destabilize the Chinese economy? It could. Um, at this point, the entire cryptocurrency market is... You know, about three hundred and fifty billion dollars, uh, the market cap. So that's all. That's all the thousands of coins, most of which is made up by Bitcoin and Litecoin and a few Ethereum and a few of the top cryptocurrencies. So at this point, it's probably too small to disrupt a multi-trillion-dollar economy. But it has the potential longer term, and I think that's what governments around the world are concerned about. Is there's people that predict Bitcoin could go to a million dollars. I think most. Most analysts and other people in the space think that's a highly unlikely scenario. But if it were to, so that would be essentially increasing by 100 times. And that would, at that point, have a, could have a major disruptive force um, or effect on world economies. Not necessarily for bad, but potentially um, could have unforeseen consequences. Could there be some kind of benefit for the Chinese government to allow the cryptocurrency exchanges again, but could they have some kind of oversight over it that would make it beneficial for them? It's possible. I mean, certainly they could require that in order to remove money from an exchange or put money onto an exchange that you have to use traditional methods like the banking system, which they control. So they could get rid of some element, a portion of the anonymity, um, by just simply cracking down on the exchanges themselves, but still allowing them to operate on the Chinese government's terms. Um, that would be one possibility. They are seemingly quite positive on blockchain itself. Even if they have serious concerns about cryptocurrency as a form of payment, the underlying technology that underlies cryptocurrency can be used for a lot of things besides cryptocurrency. Securing medical records, um, creating smart contracts, and there's, a, there's various other uses, and China has invested directly, you know, I think they're actually planning to open up a multi-billion dollar technology park that would be sort of an incubator for blockchain companies that are developing various technologies based on the blockchain. And I think they see that as being potentially lucrative. Does that carry a risk for them, though, the blockchain technology? Because if you put something in the ledger that can't be erased or changed later... Well, that actually did happen pretty recently. There was a story where a, um, Ch a Chinese student at a university posted a letter about a decades-old sexual, sexual misconduct case at Peking University, which is a very prestigious school. And the, the letter went viral. It, was, it became part of China's Me Too movement. And so, obviously, the Chinese Communist Party cracked down on Weibo posts, or cracked down on all social media posts about that. So they deleted it, basically. They deleted it, basically. But then somebody added that letter, put it back up on the Ethereum blockchain, where they can't touch it. It's there it, forever? It's it's there forever, yeah, and the Communist Party censors can't touch it. Yeah, that's a real risk, because unless you control 51% of the computing power, you have no way to change past transactions um, or past records. Then they're distributed across the globe. So it makes it very difficult for, and even in the case of having 51% of the computing power, there's certain limits to what you could, you would be able to alter. Um, so for things like social media, you could essentially create social media where, which is uncensorable. There is no 
one governing body. There is no one moderator that has the ability to take down a post. You could create social media that has certain rule, like objective rule-based um, element to it, but there will be no one moderator that's able to remove a post. So that would definitely pose a risk for, um, for authoritarian, authoritarian governments. So yeah. blockchains have more potential than just cryptocurrency. Yeah, a lot of a lot of potential, and we're, there's a lot of investment in the United States right now in it as well. And I think you know we're seeing it for um, you know for genomes. We're seeing a lot of it in healthcare, where anonymity of records uh, is important, and also making sure that they are distributed widely, so that there's accessibility widely, so that you're you you can through the use of the blockchain, you have the ability to put information out there very widely to allow it to be analyzed, and yet you can still protect the anonymity of the initial record. So, we're seeing it in a lot of cases, but we're also seeing it in competitors to YouTube like DTube that use a, a blockchain technology underlying it, which prevents censorship and that we have, we are beginning to see censorship on sites like YouTube, even if it's not directly, although they are in some cases directly censoring also through the monetization. Um, yeah. yeah, we know about that. Uh, you, yeah, you may be very here. familiar with that. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that the only way to be, have any chance of controlling this would be to have to own 51% of the processing power is the fact that so much of the uh, the mining happening in chi in China is that a way the Communist Party could con potentially control uh, the Bitcoin market? Conceivably, I mean, since over half of the actual processing is going on in China, it's it's conceivable. Although it's not being done by the Chinese government for the most part, it's being done by individuals, large companies. There's a company called Bitmain, which actually produces the processors that mine most of the Bitcoin in the world. And um, this company, that's mostly what they do. And in addition to that, they run mining pools that we talked about earlier. None of the pools that they run make up over half of the Bitcoin mining, but there are risks because they make over half of the Bitcoin mining processors. And in the past, they have had a problem with a backdoor, um, that there was potentially a backdoor. And so it is conceivable that the Chinese government could gain control, although I think it's generally seen as unlikely. Um, it's certainly not impossible. Could the Chinese government build their own blockchain? Yes. So then they would, that would be risk-free for them because they could control it. Yes, depending on how it's built. You know, you a blockchain doesn't necessarily, uh, it, they can be built in many different ways. So they could certainly have the initial code be one that allowed them a great degree of control. Um, and the 51% processing isn't the only way to um, update the ledger and blockchain. It can also be done, which is called proof of work. And it can also be done by proof of stake, which some are considering for cryptocurrencies, in which it's those who own 51% or more of the value of those coins that would actually get a say in what happens or what the, what the ledger says. So there are various ways that China could create a cryptocurrency that it had near total control over but it would need to own 51 percent of all of that money that's one of the that's one of the ways or to have over 50 percent of the processing power but they could also write the fundamental underlying code in say, such a way yeah that allowed them to have a great deal of control over it. if they could if they created the blockchain then those rules wouldn't necessarily apply not necessarily so where is this technology taking us what's the future uh, it's a great question. I think a lot of people want to know the answer because there's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines waiting to see what happens. When we talk about what cryptocurrencies are worth, 300 billion is a lot of money, but it's very little compared to 30 trillion plus in world fiat currencies. So it's still a tiny player, although it's one that because it's had such enormous gains over the last year has gotten a lot of attention. And if what it did in 2017 continued for years into the future, it certainly could displace fiat currencies to a large degree. But generally that's viewed as unlikely because there are a lot of hurdles. We're talking about authoritarian governments as we've discussed that have a major problem with it, but it's not just them. There's the Federal Reserve, the European Union, um, Central Bank. They all have serious concerns about both from a money supply perspective as well as for crime, terrorism. Um, so there's a lot of headwinds facing cryptocurrency in particular, which has led a lot of people to consider investing in the other uses for blockchain um, outside of just cryptocurrency. Yeah, I guess the possibility that 
in 20, 30 years, it won't be the cryptocurrency that's the thing. It's the blockchain that is the thing. Right. And you could have a company that displaces Facebook, for example, by using blockchain technology that would prevent, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg from controlling the content. Um, so if you think about how large Facebook is um, in terms of its valuations, it's certainly conceivable that there's more money to be made and there's going to be more investment on things that either supplement current technologies or displace them. And that that could ultimately be the the major case for blockchain and that cryptocurrencies could fall to the wayside or we could use blockchain for transactions, but within the traditional system that we're all used to. Well, it still seems right now cryptocurrency is a very risky thing. I mean, a couple of months ago, Bitcoin was getting close to $20,000 a coin. Right. Now it's just under 10000 So it's, it's still very up and down. Yeah, and that makes it, I think, difficult for people to really consider using it transactionally because, you know, today I think Bitcoin was up, you know, nearly $1,000. And you go from, you know, $9,200 to $1,000, that, you know, all of a sudden uh, that purchase you made yesterday, in a sense, got a lot more expensive because you purchased it when your Bitcoin was only worth $9,200. Now it's worth $10,000. Um, and so there's the you know potential for regret. Um, and we seem to, as humans, to... Uh, remember those times in which we got screwed, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, so it certainly makes it difficult. In fiat currencies, we never think about that. I bought this for 100 US dollars and that the dollar went down a little bit relative to the euro. We just say it's $100 yesterday, it's $100 today. That's stability. And, we, and, that's, and it seems like stability and it is more stable on an on a objective level too. But we sometimes can overlook the that it's not perfectly stable because we're not converting in and out of it. And we still think of cryptocurrencies. We don't think of something costing one Bitcoin. We think of it costing X thousand dollars, which is some fraction of a Bitcoin today and some different fraction of a Bitcoin tomorrow. So you think there's a future in cryptocurrency, but not necessarily in any particular current crypto? Yes, I think that it's very risky to bet on cryptocurrencies um, that exist today. There's a potentially huge upside, but... It, there's a very high likelihood that none of them will be worth anything in five or 10 years either. So it is very risky. And you hear stories about kids putting college loans into cryptocurrencies. And it's like any other highly speculative investment that has the potential to make you a lot of money, but more than likely you're going to get burned. And I think that that's generally the case with cryptocurrency too. Economics degree lady, want to say anything? No, I'm just thinking about authoritarian regimes creating their own cryptocurrencies. <laughs> It's totally is that, possible. Is that really any scarier than anything else they do? Uh, like imagine what they're doing in the gene labs in China. Thanks right now. for that. Well, no, I think it's interesting that they could create their own cryptocurrency and the, that the Communist Party could create their own cryptocurrency because that actually would show it would be kind of consistent with how they've ado adapted other new technology, which is you learn the technology then you kind of co-opt it. Are you it. saying the Chinese Communist Party is the Borg? Uh, I think Josh gets it, right? Am I right? I'm not the only one here. Okay, I don't know if that's what I'm saying. Uh, what are you saying, Shelley? Sorry for interrupting. I just wanted to talk about Star Trek. I'm sorry. I don't know how to wrap it up. Basically, it was about the idea that them investing so heavily in blockchain mm -hmm. or looking at how to use blockchain, it fits how they adapt other technology to co-opt it and turn it into something that suits their purposes yeah i think they don't want to be reactive on the back end once the technology is out of their control any final thoughts let me go back to your what your cryptocurrency should be oh yeah how do i <laughs> so how do i start my own cryptocurrency that will be the the one that is the successful one that's low risk and everyone should invest in well you will not create one that's low risk. <laughs> I think that goes but, without saying. But I will. But so anyways, carry on. But let's, I think the best thing that you need for your cryptocurrency is branding. Mm -hmm. And I think that you're a great brand. So like most of these cryptocurrencies that have no intrinsic value, it's all about branding. So I think you and Shelly need to put your heads together and uh, come up with the, the great branding that you've used in the past for your shows and put it to your cryptocurrency. I, I see a real future in this for us, Shelly. What do you think? Uncensored coin? That does kind of, like, as a brand, that would kind of go with the whole cryptocurrency, you yeah. know. Democratic. It can have my face on it. 
<laughs> that uh, maybe your face isn't the best. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll discuss that later. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Josh. Yeah. You know, leave your comments below if you're interested in uh, our new cryptocurrency. Let us know, and uh, we'll become uh, the robber barons of the future. I just thought of something. If your face is on it, everybody will get confused and think it's like Matrix Coin or something. <laughs> there we go, Matrix Coin. <laughs> I think we can't call it Matrix Coin. We can we can call it Matrix Coin. The the, the movie does not own the term Matrix. Mm. I mean, then like. High school math class is going to talk about matrices. <laughs> oh, my God. Bringing you back to high school math classes. Well, yes. Uh, thanks for joining us for another episode of China Unscripted. We'll see you next time.